We're now going to continue our discussion of discrete probability distributions and go on to more complicated distributions over discrete outcomes, particularly the binomial and discrete distributions. So first, let's talk about the binomial distribution. So the binomial distribution, like the Bernoulli distribution, is a distribution over some process that has successes and failures. But instead of just talking about one outcome, we're going to talk about several trials of the same process repeated over multiple times. So, for example, if you have one coin and you're trying to figure out whether it's fair or not, a single coin flip is not going to tell you that. You can get heads or tails, and let's say that it's an unfair coin and tails comes up with probability 0.995, a single coin flip that comes up tails will not tell you whether it's an unfair coin or not. You need to try it many times. And so, the binomial distribution tells you, if you flip a coin so many number of times, what is the probability that you will get seven heads and two tails. One thing that's really important about the binomial distribution is that we assume that this distribution is independent, that it's the same coin that you're flipping that if you're producing parts from a factory, the probability of producing a successful part is going to be the same at every trial. So every time you do it, it's the same probability, and the outcome from trial one doesn't affect the outcome of trial two. But the outcomes are very different from the Bernoulli distribution that we talked about before. In the Bernoulli distribution, you have one trial, you can have that trial be either a success or a failure. But because we're doing repeated trials, the outcome space is now different. It is the number of successes that you have given so many trials. So, if you have eight trials, the number of successes could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8. So, every time could be a failure, every time could be a success, and everything in between. So, let's take a look at a very concrete example of this. Let's say that we're going to flip a fair coin three times. Here are all the ways that you can do that. What's the probability that when you do that, you get three heads? That's really easy to see. There's only one way that you can do that, and so you have a probability of 0.125 of getting three heads. But if you ask different questions, it's not quite so simple. So let's look at the probability of getting one head in those three trials. You could have gotten that one head on the first coin flip, the second coin flip, or the third coin flip but you also have to get tails on the other coin flips. So you need to look at all the ways that, that could have happened. So you have that happening here on the last coin flip. You have that happening here on the second coin flip. And you have that happening here on the third coin flip. So you need to find all of the ways that you could get one success out of three trials, and there are three of them. And then you need to add up all of those together, and so that gives you 3.75, once you add up 1.25 plus 1.25 plus 1.25. So you need to take all of those numbers and add them together. Okay, so this is a little complicated. We don't want to write down the probabilities for all of the events. Can we turn this into a more compact mathematical formula where we can just get the number immediately? Luckily, there is a formula we can use to compute the probability of getting x successes out of n trials. It involves, coincidentally enough, something called the binomial expansion. And so we'll talk about that in more detail in a second, but the term here, n over x, in these parentheses, is going to be telling us how many times we can get x successes out of n trials, how many different ways you can achieve that same number of successes. And then we just compute the probability of getting that many successes and that many failures, just like we did in the Bernoulli distribution. You'll notice that this distribution has two parameters. You have both the probability of success, just like we had in the Bernoulli distribution, but we also have the number of trials. So there are two parameters to this distribution. 
So let's talk about these binomial terms that are in the probability mass function. So these are the ways that you can get three heads out of five trials, or generally the number of ways that you can achieve x successes out of n trials. The formula for computing it is down here. It has factorial terms, as you can see here. One way of figuring this out, if you don't feel like computing these factorials and the numbers are small enough, is by filling out what's called Pascal's triangle. And so in Pascal's triangle, you start by writing a 1, and then you create a big triangle down the sides where 1 is on the left-hand side and 1 is on the right-hand side, all 1s. And then to fill in the inside of the triangle, you look to the numbers to your left and right above you. And so here, you have 1 and 1, you add those together and you get 2. Here you have 1 and 2, you add those together to get 3. Here you have 3 and 3, you add those together to get 6. Here you have 4 and 6, you add those together to get 10. So you keep doing that, and then you get Pascal's triangle. And from that, you can look up any of these binomial coefficients that you need. So let's say that you have three trials. That corresponds to this row of Pascal's triangle. So the third row. And we're counting from 0, so 0, 1, 2, 3. So you have three trials, and there's one way of getting no successes. There is one way of getting three successes. Similarly, there are three ways of getting either one success or two successes. In particular, if you wanted to know how many ways could you get two successes out of three trials, that would correspond to this entry here in Pascal's triangle. So you'll notice that Pascal's triangle is symmetric. The left-hand side looks exactly like the right-hand side, and there are the same number of ways you can get x successes as n minus x successes. If you've taken a more mathematically rigorous statistics course, you'll recognize this as an example of combinatorics. And combinatorics is the study of counting up the number of ways that things can happen. However, we won't go into much more detail on this. You just need to keep track of, for the binomial distribution, you need to know this formula. Let's go back to the Bernoulli distribution and compare it to the binomial distribution. Hopefully, you should recognize that a Bernoulli distribution is just a special case of the binomial distribution where you'll only have one trial. If you only have one trial of a binomial distribution, you're at the top of Pascal's triangle. And so the binomial coefficient is always 1, so that term goes away, and all that you're left with is the same formula that we had for the Bernoulli distribution. So let's see an example of this in action. Let's go back to the question of flipping a coin three times. And so if we do that, what is the probability of getting at least one head as you flip it three times? So, here we want to compute the probability of the number of heads being greater than or equal to 1. There are three different events in that union space. And so we've already computed two of these terms. And so we talked about what is the probability of getting three heads. And so there is only one way to do that, so the binomial coefficient term there is 1. So you have 3 choose 3, that's 1, and then we're going to raise 0.5 to the 3. And so that is the binomial term for that. And here we have 3 choose 2 times 0.5 squared times 0.5 to the 1, because we have two successes and one failure. And here we have 3 choose 1, and then we have 0.5 to the 1 times 0.5 to the 2. And so we add all those three things together, 
and we get 0.875. One thing that you should notice, however, is that this is symmetric to the probability of getting three tails. So we could have just computed the probability of getting three tails and taken one minus that to get the same answer. Because when you take all of the events in an outcome space, they have to sum to one. We can extend the Bernoulli distribution in another way. We can consider more than two different outcomes. Instead of just having success and failure, we could say have a distribution over the sides of a die. So instead of having a distribution over two different outcomes, we now have a distribution over k outcomes. And that is parameterized by a vector of length k. And that vector has a probability for each of the different outcomes. Say, a probability for each of the sides of your die. And so now, you need to have this vector. And when you ask, what is the probability of rolling a 3, you look in this vector and see which of those probabilities corresponds to that. And then you take that, and that becomes your probability. So, if we wanted to write this compactly, we now have to use another piece of notation. So let's take a look at this. We want to compute the probability of getting a particular outcome. And what we want to do mathematically is we want to find the corresponding index of the vector that matches x. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have an expression, the square bracket here, that corresponds to x being equal to k, that the outcome that we're looking for is equal to the index k of the vector. And so sometimes people will write it just with this bracket here. Other times they will write it with a blackboard 1, so a hollow 1 in front of it, like so. And so this is just a function that is 1 whenever the thing inside the bracket is true, and 0 otherwise. This is called an indicator function. And so when you put it inside this product, this product goes over all of the terms in the vector. And if x is not equal to k, then this becomes 0. So the product is just a 1. And if it is equal to the index, then the term in this product then becomes theta to the k raised to the first power. So you just get the appropriate probability. And this big pi here, the uppercase pi here, stands for product. And so this means we're going over each of those terms and multiplying them together. When the indicator is 0, it's contributing a 1. And when the indicator is 1, it's contributing the appropriate probability from the vector. So you'll notice that the number of free parameters of this is actually k minus 1. Because if I tell you all but one of the parameters of this vector, you can tell me the last one by taking 1 minus all of the previous probabilities. So just like the Bernoulli distribution only had one free parameter, but it had two possible outcomes, here we have k possible outcomes, but k minus 1 free parameters. So the canonical example of the categorical distribution is a k-sided die. And if you have a uniform distribution where all of the sides are equal, then you have a fair die. And if you have six sides, then it's 1 over k in each of the positions, so 1 over 6. So if you have a uniform distribution over k things, the probability of each possible event is 1 over k. So let's say that you want to sample from a categorical distribution. Sampling from a categorical distribution is a lot like sampling from a Bernoulli distribution. So in the Bernoulli distribution, you have the space between 0 and 1, and you cut it into two bits. Now we need to cut it into k bits. But where do we cut 0 to 1 so that we can sample from a categorical distribution? So what we're going to do is we're going to take all of our thetas, and at each cut, we're going to take the first thetas and add them together. The first cut has the first theta. The second cut has the first and second theta. And the third cut has the first, second, and third theta. And you're now going to draw your random number between 0 and 1, and you're going to see where it lands. And you're going to choose the index that it just got past. 
So let's see this in a little bit more detail. Let's say that you're wanting to sample from a fair die with six sides, and you draw a random number 0.452383. And so you'll first check, is that number less than the first theta? If it is, you return the first bin. It's not, so you look at the first two, you add them together. Is the number that you drew less than that? No, it's not, so you go on to the next one. Is it less than that? Yes, it is, so you return the third index, which corresponds to rolling a three. Okay, let's do this again. Let's say that you draw a random number 0.11754. So you first check, is that less than your first theta? It is, so you return x is equal to one. So now let's see what happens when you have an unfair die. Let's say that you have a very highly weighted die that almost always returns six, and has a very low probability for any of the other outcomes. So now let's say that you draw the random number 0.209581, and you first check, is it less than theta one? No. Is it less than theta one plus theta two? No. Theta one plus theta two plus theta three? No. So you keep on going, and you're not going to get less than that until you add in theta six, which is a big contributor to the probability mass. And so almost always, unless you get a very, very small number from your random generator, you will return six, showing that we have successfully modeled the probability of a weighted die. So these are the most common discrete distributions. We'll next talk about some of the more exotic discrete distributions, and talk about how we can parameterize these discrete distributions in more interesting ways.